Hi, everyone. We'll just give it a few more seconds for people to join us. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the uh, Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law seminar series at Stanford University. This is actually our final seminar of the fall quarter and we really appreciate everybody tuning in today and over the course of the past few months as we've had to host the seminar in this format. Um, we will resume these talks on Thursday, January 14th. So please be on the lookout for our new schedule, which we'll be posting on social media and on our website soon, probably sometime in December. And we ha already have a full quarter of talks lined up for then that we are very excited about new research in our field. But today we are particularly excited to welcome Salma Musa, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the CDDRL. She works on migration, conflict, and social cohesion, and some of the research she's presenting today was recently published in Science. And she recently received, like very recently, um, her PhD from Stanford's Political Science Department. So the newly minted Dr. Musa will now present. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, sounds good to hear it. <laughs> um, so thanks everyone for joining. I'm really excited to present results from a field experiment on intergroup contact and soccer in post-ISIS Iraq. And I also want to acknowledge the generous funding of FSI in getting this project off the ground back when I was piloting this as a baby third year in the PhD program. So to start, let me take you back to the summer of 2014, when a lot of us were horrified to see ISIS take over large swaths of territory in northern Iraq and Syria. Part of that campaign involved the ethnic cleansing of religious minorities, primarily Yazidis, but also smaller numbers of Christians and Muslim groups as well, hundreds of thousands of whom were forcibly displaced virtually overnight from the orange area on the map into the relative safety of the green Kurdish held area. Most people thought that the displacement would only last for a couple of days. Uh, one Christian mom who I spoke to said that she packed enough clothes for her sons for the weekend, but it was actually more than two years before they would return. And when they did return, this is what they found. They found that their schools, their businesses, their churches had been all but destroyed. Here are uh, pictures I took of the two largest churches in the Christian city of Karakosh in Northern Iraq. Um, you can see heavy damage from air raids and from firefights and ISIS basically torched these buildings uh, on their way uh, out of the town. And I took these pictures in 2018, but unfortunately these places more or less still look like this. So reconstruction has been very slow. <clears throat> Christians also found a similar level of damage to their homes. So here is, on the left is a Christian home I visited where you can see uh, the AC was pried off the wall in the top left corner there. Uh, you can see the beginnings of an ISIS fighter digging a tunnel before uh, giving up. Uh, and that house was actually fairly new. You can see the tiling and the paint actually looks new, which is, um, which is very strange to see. And on the right is uh, another Christian home, also in Farakush, and it has this ISIS graffiti outside, which says the Islamic State lives on or will live on. And I spoke to the people who lived in this house and maybe naively asked them, why don't you just paint over this graffiti? And they were really adamant that they wouldn't paint over it. And they wanted this to serve as a testament to the world of what had happened to them um, and to really ingrain this experience into the Christian collective identity, that they are victims of an ethnic cleansing and they don't want to forget about this anytime soon. And because I think the people who went through this experience can describe it better than I can, here is a short clip of one of the study participants, Romi and his mother talking about their displacement experience. Rami Hanna is one of thousands that fled Karakosh as ISIS approached. Rami's mother thought they would only be gone for a few days. So 
so as you can see, this kind of experience, this ISIS occupation and then the displacement experience really um, hardened those group identities. It, as you can imagine, it devastated social trust in the area, especially between Christians toward Muslims who are either seen as ISIS collaborators for choosing to stay behind, uh, or e even if the Muslims themselves were persecuted by ISIS, they're resented for diluting the Christian identity of these towns and uh, neighborhoods. So regardless of the source of resentment, you have a lot of distrust toward Muslims. Um, this experience has also increased support for Christians arming themselves for self-defense militias and even reprisal killings in the future. So fixing or restoring these intergroup relations matters in and of itself, but it's also a worthy goal because this kind of low social cohesion and low social trust correlates with a variety of negative outcomes. So it comes along with authoritarian rule in the Middle East. The type of zero sum politics we have in the Middle East itself increases violence toward the state and toward religious minorities. The conflict process polarizes and transforms uh, social identities um, and it leads to this social segregation. So to illustrate this point, here's a plot of uh, Baghdad in 2005 and 2007. The green areas are mixed Tunisia. Uh, and the blue are mostly Shia, the red are mostly Sunni, and the red dots are particularly uh, lethal uh, bombings. And you can see that in 2005, Baghdad was actually a very integrated city. Uh, fast forward two years with this kind of violence and it, and it just accelerated this process of social segregation and it became a very divided city very quickly. And so we're left with this social trap where you have low social cohesion, which comes along with low political and economic development which itself increases the likelihood of future violence. And that violence itself undermines social cohesion, which increases the risk of violence in the future. And so it becomes this vicious cycle. So we know that this social trap exists, but we know less about how we can get out of it and how you can build social cohesion after war. Uh, and I define social cohesion as a mixture of both trust and tolerance toward out groups who live close enough in proximity that we can live and work with them. And so we have a set of tools at the institutional and at the grassroots level that we think can help. So at the institutional level, you have things like power sharing arrangements or peacekeeping uh, operations. At the grassroots level, you have interventions like intergroup dialogue or community driven development programs. And my uh, favorite approach, which I test here is intergroup contact. Uh, this famous theory from the 50s, uh, that positive cooperative contact on the whole can reduce prejudice can build friendships and in general improve intergroup relations. And the recent causal evidence base on contact seems promising. It does seem like this kind of contact does generally improve relations, but there's still a lot that we don't know. So first, we don't know whether contact can actually change real world behaviors. So most studies rely on attitude, self-reported attitudes measured right after the intervention. Um, but more importantly, there's this critical assumption in the contact theory which is that any positive effects toward contact partners, the, the individuals you actually meet, that that positive feeling and maybe behavior is going to necessarily generalize and extend to that entire group into other diverse social settings. And this particular assumption actually hasn't uh, really been tested, even though it's the, the theory rests on this uh, ability to make that generalization. Um, we also don't know about much about how contact should operate uh, during or after conflict. And in fact, what we do know suggests that um, it might not operate similarly and might not be very powerful at all. Uh, so we know that prejudice is particularly sticky among adults, among those who have been exposed to violence. And when the nature of prejudice itself is both e is ethnic or religious, as opposed to prejudice toward the elderly or the disabled, for example, which tends to be easier to shift. And lastly, and um, I don't actually test this in this study, but I wanted to flag that we still don't really know which type of contact matters. So the original like three key conditions of, of the, the stipulated by the theory that contact should invo involve cooperation for a common goal. It should be endorsed by communal authorities and norms and that it, it should involve equal power status within the intervention, even if groups are unequal in society. Uh, these different, we don't actually know which of these conditions are necessary or sufficient or which ones uh, matter more, except for some evidence we do have on the importance of cooperation. So what I did in this study is I held constant the, the optimal conditions of contact. So I'm not messing with the different types of contact. I'm holding that constant at its, at its ideal level as much as possible. And I'm doing that via a soccer program. Uh, and soccer and team sports in general, they take a lot of the boxes I just mentioned. You have equal power status, you have endorsement by communal authorities, in this case, coaches, but also Christian community leaders as well. 
um, and you have cooperation for a common goal. I then test this type of ideal contact in a post-conflict setting and measure its effect on real world behavior. So my narrower research question is, can intergroup contact build tolerant attitudes and behaviors after war? And to preview the main results, I found that contact improved everyday behaviors among peers who met within the intervention, but it did not actually generalize and build more widespread social cohesion. So for the rest of the talk, I'll uh, outline the experimental design, dive straight into the main results, uh, discuss some possible mechanisms, and then really dig into this pattern of why contact failed to unlock these broader uh, patterns of social cohesion. And then I'll reflect on generalizability and policy implications. So the experimental design uh, here, the goal of the experiment was to build Christian tolerance toward Muslims. And this might seem a little bit backwards. The bigger social challenge in the Middle East is Muslim intolerance of Christians. Uh, but in these two study sites that I was working in, Christians are actually the majority group. And I limited participants only to those who were displaced. So uh, I anticipated that there would be benefits to building social cohesion, even among Christians and Muslims among displaced people with a focus on Christians, given that, given that they are the majority in this uh, group, in this area. The sample consisted of 42 Christian soccer teams spread across two study sites, uh, one in Ankawa, which is a suburb of Erbil, and one in Karakosh. And so what I did was I teamed up with this Christian, local Christian community organization and there seemed to be a really large demand for amateur soccer leagues. And they wanted to provide this program to, to these displaced Christians who were, um, who were just kind of sitting around and needed something to do all day. Uh, and so we decided to create these, this new set of leagues and we invited all the teams in the area to participate. And these teams are segregated largely by religion. So we invited the Christian teams to participate and we said these leagues are gonna be like really professional and really fun. Uh, the, the fields are gonna be new and there's gonna be professional referees and bleachers and people are gonna watch. Um, and so, the, so we wanted them to, you know, to entice them to join and they did, um, but we had two conditions for participating. The first was that they take baseline and endline surveys. And the second was that they agree to receive added players on their team. And those three or four added players on their team may or may not be Christian. So I conducted this randomization based on baseline empathy toward Muslims. And this is what the randomization looked like. So if you're randomized into the control group, your team received three or four Christian players. If you're randomized into the treatment group, you received three or four Muslim players. So the randomization happened at the team level. Um, so teams were randomized into being mixed or, or remaining all Christian. And then the, an additional layer of randomization was these added players. So these three or four guys who were added they themselves were drawn from the rosters of teams who either weren't included in the, in the study or their free agents who trained with other teams in the area. But importantly, they were a very similar skill level. So they played in these amateur leagues and actually we have baseline balance on their baseline level of skill. So if we find any effect, it's not because the Muslim players were better than the Christian players. This left me with four leagues, which took place in two sites uh, where the players trained and competed for a two month competition. So who are these players? The median participant was 23 years old, not married, um, doesn't have a job, and his highest, his highest level of education is a high school degree. In terms of his intergroup attitudes, he has few to no Muslim friends, he would not sell land to Muslims, and he would not want to have a Muslim as a neighbor. How did they compare with the general population of displaced Christians? Uh, here I'm comparing the baseline study sample with a survey of over a thousand Christian IDPs um, who I surveyed around the same time in uh, 20, 2017. And we see that the players in the study are less likely to say that coexistence is possible, less likely to say that Muslims are welcoming, less likely to, be, to want to sell land to Muslims. Uh, and they're a little bit more likely to say that Christians should be armed and maybe not coincidentally more likely to say that Iraq is safe because they're the ones who have the arms. How do I know if this study, uh, if this experiment worked? So I have this uh, three sets of outcomes. Again, back to the, one of the main motivations of the study is to test whether contact effects can generalize to other social settings outside the intervention when you're dealing with strangers from the out group. So my first set of outcomes looks at what I call on the field behaviors. So this captures trust and tolerance toward the Muslims you meet on your team or in the league. Then I'll talk about my off the field behaviors, which capture trust and tolerance toward Muslims in general. 
and then finally a set of attitudes. So I've measured these three on the field behaviors. The first is whether a player signs up for a mixed team next season, whether they vote for a Muslim not on their team to receive a sportsmanship award, and whether they train with Muslims six months after the intervention ends. And so these three measures capture, generally capture trust and tolerance toward players who you met either on your team or in the league. So training with Muslims, for example, most of them continue training with the ones who are assigned to them. So it captures tolerance toward those on your team. Moving to the off the field behaviors that capture broader uh, trust and tolerance toward Muslims. I look at whether you attend a mixed social event three months after the intervention ends. So here Christians were faced with the prospect of socializing not only with Muslims who they meet in the leagues, but their family and friends and other Muslims in the neighborhood as well. So this was an event that involved traditional dinner and dancing that was set up by the league staff, but was open to the entire town. And for one of the leagues, it actually coincided with the fast breaking meal in Ramadan, Iftar. So it was very salient to the Christians that Muslims would be coming in to break their fast. And in case you're curious about what this event looked like, here's a little clip I stole from Facebook Live uh, showing you a little clip of the dancing. So traditional Syriac dancing and music, um, like any party, a lot of people who are just watching them dance. Um, yeah, so I think this gives you a flavor of, of what this event looked like. The second behavior I look at is whether you are likely to patronize a business in a Muslim dominated city, in this case, Mosul. So Mosul is a 40 minute drive away. It's a Muslim dominated city. It was the de facto capital of ISIS um, in Iraq. And for many Christians, they haven't gone back since the occupation. It's very much associated with, with ISIS and there's too many Muslims and Christians have kind of retreated to their enclaves. And so to know whether contact can overcome these structural problems like social segregation and reduce intergroup anxiety around being in public, different public spaces dominated by the outgroup, I instituted this voucher system with a restaurant based in Mosul. So here you can see a picture of one of the vouchers that were stamped with the participants' unique IDs, uh, and they were valid for three or four months after the leagues ended. So we then collected these coupons at the end of that period to know who actually showed up. And lastly, I look at whether you donate your $1 survey compensation either to a neutral NGO, uh, which serves both Christians and Muslims, or whether you donate your uh, compensation to the church, which obviously only serves Christians. So now I'll dive straight into the main results. Oh, not yet. Just kidding, the attitudes. Um, so I measure eight uh, attitudinal items using baseline and endline surveys. And I use a hierarchical clustering model to collapse these into indices. So this is essentially a factor analysis, but rather than me manually putting the items together and then running the factor analysis, it's a data-driven way of identifying these latent clusters in the data. Uh, so the first index I call national unity. This consisted of these abstract items like um, ethnic and religious boundaries are arbitrary and it's important to treat each other as Iraqis first. The second index I label Muslim blame. This consists of items, uh, this consists of a question, questions on how much you blame various Muslim civilian groups for Christian suffering. And the last one I call Muslim neighbor. So would you be okay with these various Muslim groups as your neighbors? So now we can dive into the main results. So on the left panel, uh, you see the covariate adjusted means for the treatment and the control group. And on the right panel, you can see that difference in means, so the treatment effects with a 95% confidence interval. So starting with the top left, the on the field outcomes, uh, being assigned to a mixed team made you about 50 percentage points more likely to be training with a Muslim six months later. It made you 26 percentage points more likely to vote for a Muslim not on your team to receive a sportsmanship award. And it made you 13 points more likely <clears throat> to sign up for a mixed team next season. Moving to the off the field outcomes, the results here are generally much smaller and often not distinguishable from zero. So you're not detectably more likely to visit Mosul, you are not more likely to attend the mixed social event, and you are not more likely to donate your survey compensation to the mixed NGO. And when you actually test these patterns against each other, uh, which I do and I, I have in the appendix, you are actually statistically significantly more likely to engage in an on the field as opposed to an off the field outcome. So this isn't just a pattern of positive results and null results, it's actually, these patterns are actually distinguishable from each other. 
Uh, and with regards to the attitudes, I found an increase in the this abstract national unity index. But for the other two indices that ask specifically about attitudes toward Muslims, I find no change. So this builds a broader picture, suggesting that this kind of contact on a on a mixed soccer team improved how you feel about Muslims who you might individually meet and know, but it did not change your general view or your general behavior toward Muslims outside the intervention in general. So there's a couple of different mechanisms that loom large in the contact literature. I don't have a lot of power to get into a lot of these subgroup analyses, but um, having said that, I don't find evidence for contact increasing information about Muslims, nor do I find evidence that contact increased empathy toward Muslims. I do find some suggestive evidence that contact changed norms that normalized contact in other settings like friendships, for example. Um, and this is among both the players and local residents who were exposed to the leagues as well. And I find evidence for the importance of having a positive experience, which I proxy for being on a, on, a, on a team that ends up being successful. So starting first with the changing norms, uh, it seemed that contact within the within the, a team really normalized uh, contact outside outside of the, the leagues and other settings. So here's a quote from a player interviewed about three or four months after the leagues ended, saying, honestly, before you would never see Muslims playing with a Christian team. This is the first time because of the league. And he's right. So of the 42 teams in the study, only two of them at baseline said that they had ever trained with Muslims. So just that basic norm of, is it even okay to play soccer with Muslims seemed to have changed. Another Christian player said, when the game is over, we hug and kiss even when we lose. That was really a huge thing. So again, these micro gestures that just show some friendliness, at least in the soccer domain, domain seem to have changed as a result of the intervention. Uh, and here's uh, another short clip of Rami, the Christian player you met earlier, followed by Muhammad, a Muslim player, uh, speaking a little bit about these changing norms and these friendships that emerged. <laughs> And there was a lot of this anecdotal evidence that came out that some friendships really did emerge. So some Christians on mixed teams, for example, started covering the cab fare for their Muslim teammates. Um, the research staff stumbled upon them, like going into different cafes and watching soccer games together, which is actually a fairly costly thing to do, given that you actually cannot enter Muslim business, uh, sorry, Christian bars or restaurants without showing your ID and proving that you're Christian. So Muslims are basically not allowed in. And we actually saw saw one of the teams haggling with the staff to let their Muslim friends come come into the bar and watch a, a Champions League game with them. Um, so that there was plenty of evidence to this effect, at least within the realm of soccer, we, that some of these friendships emerged. And it seems like, uh, at least from a very suggestive uh, preliminary, um, at a very preliminary stage, that there was some normalization of contact among local residents as well. Uh, so here on the left, you can see a league game in one of the first waves of the study. So the AstroTurf is a little sad looking, but we did improve that later. Uh, and you can see that hundreds of people would actually line around the field and watch these games. And so I did a random, uh, I, I did a survey among a random sample of about 150 residents of Karakosh. And of course, this is just correlational and there's some selection. So you're more likely to show, come up to come to the games if you're more tolerant, perhaps. But there does seem to be this positive relationship between the number of games you attended. So here on the plot, you can see um, the difference between going to the 25th percentile of games attended, which was around six, and moving to a high or 75th percentile number of games, which was around 23. And uh, your support for future mixed activities in the town. And the examples that were given were women's volleyball teams and uh, gardening clubs. So again, this is just preliminary, but this, this is some suggestive evidence that we should be looking at spillover effects when we study contact. And that's something I look at in future uh, and upcoming work. It also seems that this positive experience or being on a team that ended up actually being very successful um, does, does also seem to be correlated with larger effects. So there's a big qualifier here that there's probably some post-treatment bias and it's hard to predict success a priori. And of course, when you get into these subgroup analyses, you're slicing the sample and so uh, it's not super well powered. But having said that, I find that being assigned to a mixed team in and of itself does not actually make you more successful. 
Um, and being assigned to a successful team in general, regardless of who your teammates were, itself is unrelated to tolerance. But what I do find is this interaction. So being assigned to a successful mixed team is associated with the highest outcomes across the board. So here I'm dividing or I'm subsetting the data conditional on uh, team success. So these are only those who were, who were assigned to teams that eventually became successful. I define success as making it to the knockout phase or the finals phase of the leagues. Um, and of course, it's a small sample, but you can see here that you are more likely to go to the restaurant in Mosul, to attend the mixed social event, to train with Muslims, and really across the board, you're more likely to engage in these outcomes if you were on a mixed successful team as opposed to just a successful team. So there's something here, I think, going on with, with, uh, with performance and a positive experience that, um, that's, that's important to look at. So I talked a little bit about the players assigned to the, to the mixed teams and what could be happening there in terms of pathways from contact to tolerance. Um, but this still leaves us with this overall puzzle, which is why didn't these positive effects extend to other social contexts? Why didn't they generalize? And there's a few different ways you can structure this result, but here are some explanations I think are plausible. The first is that trusting strangers might just be too much of an ask after the kind of displacement experience that these people have gone through. It's just asking too much. Um, and so here, I always think of the story of this young man on the left who held up a picture of his, I think it's his father, his uncle, who had passed away in the fighting. And unfortunately, this was, this was relatively common. Uh, and at the same time, you see the same guy in the picture on the right, sitting like in the black pants, cross-legged. And he's with his Muslim friends and they're joking and laughing and he doesn't see a disconnect between knowing a handful of Muslims and liking them and trusting them and the fact that he's not gonna change his mind about Muslims in general, given what he's gone through. And relatedly, these off the field behaviors are much more costly, like both from an economic perspective, but also socially and psychologically. And that's precisely the point that trusting strangers is qualitatively much more costly and much more difficult and once we start to disentangle trusting people you know versus don't know and making that leap, that's where you're going to see you're going to lose a lot of people. Um, and it makes us maybe a little bit more uh, skeptical about these kinds of contact interventions, perhaps. Um, so it could be the case that contact just doesn't work. And once we start measuring uh, effects toward known contacts versus strangers, you're going to find the same pattern. Or this could be a result of or an artifact of this post-war setting where I'm also looking at a persecuted minority in a post-war setting. Uh, and we know that minorities in the Middle East in general are less trusting than their Muslim counterparts. Uh, and we also know that contact in general tends to be less effective for people who belong to disadvantaged minority groups. Um, and so this suggests that we might actually need institutional change and we need to combine that policy level uh, intervention with these grassroots programs in order to make that leap into trusting uh, strangers and, and building broader social cohesion. And these grassroots programs just may not be enough in and of themselves. Lastly, it's possible that the specific Muslims who were on these mixed teams were not seen as typical for whatever reason. And so um, it's kind of it makes sense logically, but it's also uh, a component of the comp contact theory, which is that the one or two people who you personally meet you have to view them as representative or typical in some way in order for this inferential process to be kicked off. In order for you to update your views about all Muslims, you have to view the one who you met as somehow typical or else there's no, uh, there's no um, connect between that person and the, and the broader out group. So it could be the case that these Muslims were not seen as typical for some reason. Um, this is also something I wanna look at in future work, what drives these perceptions of typicality. Uh, so this, this intervention, the treatment itself, and the, uh, the backdrop are particular in a few ways that have implications for generalizability. So I think, you know, based on my experience running these leagues, I thought that it was important that they were endorsed by communal authorities as the contact theory uh, recommends. So here on the left, you see a priest who is handing out awards. On the right, you see a police officer and a member of security of one of the security forces uh, posing with this horrifying mascot who I personally did not endorse. Um, and so it was, I think this just made Christians feel a lot more comfortable even signing up for the leagues, knowing that it wouldn't be stigmatized. On to the, one of the original uh, contact conditions, cooperation, I would actually add a wrinkle to that, that it's not just that cooperation is important, but you need to have an underlying willingness and ability to cooperate. So you have to be willing to cooperate and to accept these mixed players and accept their contributions from the Christian perspective. 
And from the Muslim perspective, it was important that they had a decent skill level that they could actually bring something to the table. So I don't think I would have found these effects, for example, if the Muslim players all sucked. Uh, I also think it was important that this intervention was apolitical. Uh, for you have that first order problem of encouraging people to even sign up for these programs and to get over that hurdle, uh, you're going to lose a lot of people if it's about interfaith dialogue, for example, which a lot of people in the Middle East are not interested in, and they think it's just repeating platitudes that we see on TV. The trade off of not explicitly discussing or addressing the roots of the conflict is that I don't see any changes to political attitudes or views about Muslims as ISIS collaborators, for example. And so these, uh, these conditions seem to hold in other settings as well, like classrooms, like roommate assignments and dormitories, like military training or conscription programs, and even some workplace settings. And that is where the causal evidence based on contact seems to be uh, showing positive results. So to wrap up, I've uh, shown you some causal evidence from a post-war setting that cooperative contact can build everyday, very narrow social cohesion but that this transformative change of building cohesion outside of this particular program was much more difficult. And so this leaves us with a lot of open questions. So first, is this local cohesion enough? Was going through this program on a mixed team, was that enough to build resilience to future sh shocks to tolerance? When there's an ethnic entrepreneur, for example, who stokes tensions or when violence breaks out again, are these guys on mixed teams gonna be more resilient? And that's an open question. Um, or it might be that we need to combine these grassroots programs with the institutional change, things like structural protections for minorities in order to unlock those broader effects. And it could also be that the, uh, these spillover effects are another and changing norms are another avenue for making contact programs matter and be uh, impactful, even if uh, we don't have this generalized tolerance toward people outside the intervention. Uh, I think this also points to the importance of measuring real world behaviors. Uh, not just uh, attitudes or lab games, for example, which, which it's kind of unclear the relationship with real world behaviors. Um, but on the whole, this suggests a need to revisit this classic literature on social trust and social capital, and that these cross-cutting civic organizations can actually be uh, effective to an extent in building these kinds of weak ties that we think are the engines for driving social trust and to really focus on that intergroup contact, doing the work in the cross-cutting nature of those organizations. And with that, I welcome your feedback and your questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Salma. What a fascinating project. I have, we've got a few questions, so let's go ahead and start. Um, Asim Fayez is asking if the success effect can be explained alternatively by extended exposure. So if your team made it to the final stages, you spent much more time with them. Did you find that that was a potential mechanism? Yeah, so actually being on a successful team only increased your exposure by two weeks. So it was an added like one to two weeks um, in what was overall like an eight or nine week program. So I didn't think that that was particularly effective. Like, I don't think that that was maybe leading to a step change in the, in the results. But yeah, it's definitely a combination of a little bit of an increased dose with the success. This is a related question from Fabian Valerio asking if the correlation between mixed and successful teams that was positive um, for off the field behaviors, if you saw anything that was the inverse of that. Were there maybe negative correlations between unsuccessful and mixed teams? Like, did that possibly worsen relations? Um, yeah, so I didn't, so at being like successful or not successful in and of itself was unrelated to tolerance. Um, but it seems like, and what you just mentioned, the cell of being on like a bad mixed team, that also, there didn't seem to be anything going on there. But it's that inter interaction of being on a successful mixed team, which seems to be uh, really shaping the outcomes. Um, but I also look at kind of the potential for backlash effects in other ways. So I look at whether uh, a game brings together a mixed team and an all-Christian team, for example, and I don't find that there are more red or yellow cards, for example, in those kinds mm -hmm. of games, which I proxy for aggression or violence. So there doesn't seem to be a backlash from the control guys who are facing these mixed teams. And then looking at the control teams over time, they're also not becoming more prejudiced over time. Um, so this is not... So a little bit related to your question. So how can we rule out backlash effects, um, at least for, from the side of the control players, that doesn't seem to be the case either. Okay, again, a reminder for anyone who has questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box and, um, and we'll have plenty of time to get to them. So the next question is from Eric Jensen, who asks, thinking about institutional change, do you think your contact findings could translate from the soccer pitch to the classroom? 
a couple of private universities in Iraq consciously increased inter-ethnic and inter-religious contact in the classroom. So has that been something that you've either thought about how it would translate or are there findings empirically about how classroom intergroup contact works? Uh, firstly, if you know anyone who's working on that program, email me so I can find a way to evaluate it because that sounds fascinating. Um, so actually the contact theory itself came about by, it was proposed by Gordon Allport in the 50s in response to the desegregation of US schools. And it was precisely the classroom context was supposed to be the environment to create these kinds of positive effects. Um, the one thing I'd say is that maybe the cooperation element is not as strong in classroom environments, unless you're specifically assigned to teams to work on a project together, it might be, you know, not as strong. Um, and you might have some backlash if the skill levels are not the same. So if some people in the class are, see, are being seen as holding back the others, and that is something we've seen with um, this particular model called jigsaw classrooms, um, which didn't seem to work as proposed for this reason. Um, having said that, in general, like the observational evidence, at least from classroom settings, suggests that contact is associated mm -hmm. with more cross-group friendships and tolerance. Um, I myself have a study from US classrooms showing that that's the case when it comes to virtual contact, um, but we actually don't have that much causal evidence. And the, actually one experimental study we do have from Nigeria between Muslims and Christians assigned to a computer classroom, computer studies classroom actually finds basically that the control group became more prejudiced over time and the treated groups were stable. So kind of a positive effect, but not as strong as we might expect. So there's a big need to evaluate these programs and please get in touch with me. Um, so I have a question about uh, attitude. It was interesting that you asked the attendees of the sports events what their attitudes were. Um, and when we think about sports in societies, they obviously do a lot to shape both attitudes of fans and also of the direct communities that the athletes may live in and serve. So if you think about a country like the United States, athletes have been very vocal in causes like Black Lives Matter. Do you have either findings from this project or from related research showing how potentially at the national level in very polarized societies or regarding specific social or ethnic cleavages, um, sports can be a route to depolarization? Love this question because this is exactly like where my research agenda is going. Um, so I think there's a, a qualitative difference between sports where you're actually playing on the same team and that kind of traditional contact you're getting as opposed to fans being exposed to sports on TV. And looking specifically at this exposure of fans to athletes. So um, a couple of things on this. So I have a project on exposure to a Muslim soccer star who plays for Liverpool, Mohamed Salah. And he's a very visibly Muslim player. Like he prays after he scores, his wife wears a headscarf, his daughter's name is Mecca. And with co-authors, we actually do find that exposure to, to Salah when he joined the team as proxied by being a Liverpool fan, reduced hate crimes in the county of Liverpool, where Liverpool sits. And it reduced anti-Muslim tweets by Liverpool fans as opposed to fans of the other top five clubs in the Premier League. And what we find in a survey experiment is that Salah's salient Muslim identity was really important in having people's positive attitudes toward him generalized to Muslims in general. So like make, priming people to think about him as a religious Muslim unlocked those effects as opposed to priming people to think about his success or that he's a nice guy, for example. Having said that, during the, back, the, the backdrop of our study was that he, he, Salah and Liverpool were doing very, very well during the study period. And so there's a question of what is the backlash when these minority players stop performing? Like when he stops scoring goals, what are we gonna see? And so this is where my future research is going, like trying to understand the importance of, of performing and being almost like a model minority in a way to be uh, for these uh, effects on tolerance to, to take place. And what is the backlash effect for minority players when they don't perform? Um, and there's also a bit of a tension here in the contact theory, uh, contact scholarship because this work on parasocial contact, so being exposed via TV or a TV show or athletes or this kind of mediated contact, contact scholars will tell you that, that it, it's mo most effective if that contact is counter stereotypical. So if you're looking at like a black athlete on TV and they're, and they're confirming your stereotypes, you're not gonna see uh, prejudice reduction. But at the same time, they say that the person you meet has to be typical and their group identity has to be salient in order for these effects to to be activated. So I think there's actually a tension there and this is exactly where my future research is going to understand 
these conditions. Um, and I know I'm rambling, but one last thing on the politicization, because I think you, you mentioned this as well. Um, so looking at someone like Colin Kaepernick, for example, by definition, he's taking a political position, which is polarizing. And that polarization is going to reduce his support among the fan base. He's dividing the fan base. So I think if, if you're an af athlete and your goal is for you to be a representation, a positive representation that reduces prejudice, it might be that you actually shouldn't take those, uh, those kinds of political positions that polarize people. Muhammad Salah, for example, never talks about the plight of Muslims in China or in the UK or anything else. If your goal is social justice or activism, that's another story. Um, but taking those, that politicization is something that we found um, that we speculate in our Salah paper as being something that was actually could be very important for those effects to, for those effects to have taken place. Excellent. Um, so a question from Frank Fujiyama. Uh, it seems to me that shared stress or effort does more for bonding than for casual contact. So in this respect, sports is a good bond builder, as is being in combat together, for example. Do you have data on how bonding varies with the level of shared stress? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I'm not sure how I would measure stress in this case, but the leagues were designed to be these were designed to be very prestigious and very competitive. So people took the competition very seriously. And so that I think across the board increased both the opportunity and the need for mutual reliance because they were taken very seriously. Had I created like an amateur league where I kind of uh, created the teams from scratch and there wasn't as much buy-in, not as much of a team identity, maybe if there were no fans watching and the stakes were lower, then I think the stress would have, been, would have been lower. But in this case, we kind of dialed up all of those things to 10 because we wanted people to be committed and that's what they wanted. They wanted this to be like a worthwhile use of their time to be a very competitive, um, almost like semi-professional set of leagues. So I agree with you. This is also the key in those combat situations or like military training or uh, in combat units. And actually I have another project with David Layton looking at Vietnam veterans and whether if you were assigned to a mixed squad uh, squadron, were you then more likely to um, have an interracial marriage, for example, um, precisely because that combat experience, obviously it's much more extreme, but it's a similar concept of mutual reliance. Okay, excellent. Um, so a question from Hisham Salam. Thank you for sharing your fascinating research. Could you speak about the plans to extend this research elsewhere, particularly how they might vary the findings across different Arab countries in particular? Yes, yeah, so uh, I have a series of contact projects now across the region. Um, I have one in Lebanon where we just wrapped up the pilot, which is a similar, it's using the backdrop of soccer, but we're also combining the contact with another treatment arm, which is empathy building education. So what are the added returns, not just to be on a mixed team, but to receiving this instruction about how to build empathy um, specifically towards Syrian refugees. I have another project in Jordan, which looks at uh, power imbalances and hierarchies and how they shame the, shape the outcomes of contact. So Allport says we need to have contact on equal footing, but in real life that never happens. And so looking at actually with, with a, we're partnering with an organic composting plant in Jordan, where we're able to randomize whether the leader of these like working groups who, who work on composting to create fertilizer, whether the leader is a Syrian or Jordanian and how that power differential, like that either stresses power imbalances in society or reduces them and it's a bit more toward equality between Syrians and Jordanians. Um, how that shapes the outcomes of contact as well. Um, so, and for all of these studies, we're also breaking apart the results by whether you belong to the minority group or the majority group, since that seems to be, like with this Iraq study, it really seemed like being a member of a persecuted minority was key for the, the, the lack of generalization potentially. So I really wanna see, is this easier when you're looking at uh, someone who belongs to an advantaged minority group, uh, majority group? A question from Leah Rosenzweig, do you think that the results, especially with respect to generalizability and changing behaviors outside of soccer, would have been any different if the population of interest were young women instead of young men in a non-sports cooperative setting? The identity of the subjects in the contact experiment should matter depending on who the norm enforcers in the community are. So do you have any sense of whether men or women are more often the norm enforcers of intergroup contact or of negative attitudes towards the outgroup in this setting? Yeah, uh, it's, I have something I've thought about a lot. Um, so in this setting, I actually had was interested in doing something, a program focused on women uh, to start out with. And it became very clear very quickly that 
the men are the norm enforcers in the society and that they would not allow basically their sisters or their wives to engage in an intergroup contact program without them there. And so for that reason, we had to pivot toward men. Um, but at the same time, like this experience, like you, women are basically n never in a public space without like a male relative. So knowing that also made me think that the men are the norm enforcers and the norm shapers. And so targeting them actually might be one way to increase the impact of contact if they are the norm changers in this way. If I were to target women, either in this setting or in another setting, I don't know how the results would change, but my speculation would be that in general, um, it seems like women have more pro-social attitudes and more empathetic attitudes. And so it could potentially be easier to shift women on prejudice, but that's an open question. Okay, a question from Brett Carter um, that it's hard to know if this is good news, the results of your study, and in some ways it might even seem potentially depressing. So because you have to force social contact and even then contact only conditions attitudes towards people with whom you have direct contact. So his questions are, is there a broader outcome you wish you had measured but didn't to show some kind of effect? And do you think there's some way you could have changed the treatment to get an effect on broader outcomes? So first I'll say that um, I, I did force the contact. I mean, that was the intervention, but my outcome on training with Muslims six months after the intervention ended, like that massive treatment effect, that one for me is not so much an outcome. It's more a test of whether the treatment persists after the intervention officially ends. So that is good news that after the intervention ended six months later, like most of those guys are still training with each other, which was not the case before. Um, and yeah, you can argue that in this very fragile environment, even being able to build those weak ties within the intervention is, is a success. Um, but what, what, I, what would I have done differently? To be honest, this was both an ideal form of contact from a theoretical perspective and the intensity and the frequency of the contact was very high. So an, a two month intervention is really on the really high end when it comes to contact programs. So, I don't think that I could have really done anything else from, from that perspective. Um, we had hit all the optimal conditions. Um, sorry, there was another piece of that question that I, do you mind repeating it? I think I missed one piece of that question. Um, is, there, is there some way the treatment could have varied to get a bigger effect on broader outcomes? Oh, oh uh, which one do I wish, sorry, the outcomes I wish I had measured. So social cohesion and these outcomes I measured, I see as being like an intermediary step toward the overarching goal, which is either the prevention of violence or resilience when future violence breaks out. Like that's ultimately what we care about with these programs. So that's something I hope I can do in the future. It's very tricky to do. It's not just a matter of looking at long-term effects. It's not just a time horizon thing. It's also, it's also looking at the robustness of these effects when these shocks to tolerance happen. Um, and that's something I hope to look at in future work to understand how exposure to those shocks to tolerance in the future, like can they actually build some resilience? So that's what I wish I had measured, but you know, step by step. Um, a question from Barry Harper about, again, about sports more broadly. Do you know what the religious makeup is of the national team? And I guess we could think about this cross nationally as well in other countries, if there are more diverse, more or less diverse national teams, does that help bring together at least audiences or fans? You know, I'm going to defer to Leah on this, like another another postdoc at uh, CDDRL, because she has a fantastic paper on how the performance of the national team can either unite a country or divide a country. Um, the Iraqi national team actually historically has been uh, diverse, and actually they had a big win, I think it, it was some point in the late 2000s, I don't remember the exact date but they won the Asian cup, I believe. And it was with a like mixed Sunni Shia team that overcame all these obstacles. And it was a real moment of pride for Iraqis. Um, so I think that that's definitely real, uh, that that can have a real effect when you look at the national team as being like reflective of the country's composition, but also when they do well, it just, I think it really enforces this, this national pride and maybe a national unity. Um, that's not the case in other Middle Eastern countries. So the Egyptian national team, for example, um, historically has had almost no Christians on it, which doesn't really make sense because 10% of that team should be Christians. So there's that question of who actually gets onto the team and that you have to then look into how the, how the, the first division and second division is structured and who makes the decisions about who, which players are picked and who go through the system. And that itself is a very politicized thing. Um, so yeah, that could be a book in and of itself. <laughs> Um, a question from Nate Grubman. You mentioned that you keep stats on red cards and yellow cards during games. 
Do you collect any other game-based statistics? Like were Muslim players treated differently in terms of prominence of their positions on the field or how often they got the ball, playing time, et cetera? And did this change over time? He's curious because if the in-game interactions varied, um, could, did that contribute to success on, in the performance of the teams? I wish I could do that. And I think there is a way to do it. Like there are like Russian firms where you can give them the footage of a soccer game and they will like type up some kind of manuscript of who passed to who and all those game statistics. But I just didn't have the um, the money or the energy <laughs> to do that. But I thought about this as well. Like, is there more trust as measured by, you know, passing to Muslim players? Um, the other, the one statistic I do have is goals that were scored by Muslim players as opposed to Christian players where they were actually pretty balanced and they were also balanced on yellow and red cards that they received. Um, but in terms of those within game dynamics, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that granular level of data, but it, it would be a very, a very interesting measure of trust. Okay. Um, you mentioned that your, were our ultimate interest in, you know, not only your research, but also in comparative politics more broadly is how to reduce inter-ethnic violence in societies. So can you explain a little how these contact theories interact with traditional institutional or sort of macro level variables in political science, particularly those that we use to explain a, either a rise or decline in inter-ethnic violence? Yeah, so the way that I see it is that for sustainable peace to happen, you need a combination of these policy level tools and the grassroots level tools that aim at to improve these everyday interactions between individuals and that they reinforce in positive ways these policy changes like potentially power sharing arrangements or structural protections for minorities um, and that those that you need those two elements. Um, so that's on that's kind of from like a macro political perspective. At the same time, the effects of contact are can be shaped by the macro political environment as well. So this is again, getting to this point of building resilience, like how much are we shielding these communities from things that happen at the macro political level that would otherwise be, be very divisive and increase uh, calls for violence. I don't think that contact scholars will tell you that this kind of work will prevent, will, will prevent violence, but because that's probably gonna happen anyway, but it's more like, can we build some pockets of resilience and can we reach a critical mass of those pockets? that they can then either uh, lead to a norm change or that there's enough of them that the impact of those future outbreaks is lower than what it otherwise would have been. Um, but the question of how exactly the grassroots and the policy level interact with each other is actually still an open question. And that's also where my research is going now. So is the policy level enough without the grassroots stuff or what are, what are the added returns to combining the two? Right. Um, and a lot of your research and research on ethnic violence obviously takes place in polarized societies. We also know that in some places that were previously not super polarized, there's been a rise in polarization sort of in many democracies, for example, over the past 10 years or so. Do we have research from non-polarized societies that are nonetheless diverse um, that also help to get at some of the explanations for either social trust or higher levels of cooperation or lack of polarization? either related or not related to contact theory? Hmm. So contact studies or prejudice reduction studies, like by definition, they tend to happen in societies where there is some cleavage to overcome. Like that's like the goal of the study. So you're not gonna get very many in societies that are seen as being relatively peaceful, I would say. Um, I mean, the most common cleavages that I see are like ethnic or religious. So whether it's between like indigenous for example, a non-indigenous Chileans or uh, black and white Americans. Um, others look at like refugees versus hosts. So it tends, there's different sources of the cleavage, but it tends to be like a very, it tends to be some contentious and salient identity-based cleavage. Having said that, there is this observational pattern in the world. And I haven't seen the recent data on this, but it does seem like um, intergroup contact and having diverse friends, for example, or diverse coworkers generally has a positive relationship with tolerance and progressive like racial attitudes, for example. So that's really where the contact studies can, there's, we can get a lot of purchase where we can zoom in and get some causal evidence on, okay, we know this pattern exists, but there's a big selection where more tolerant people choose to have more diverse friends. So what happens when we assign the, an average person to receive this kind of contact where we take away the selection problem? Um, so I'm not sure if that gets at the question, but yeah, it tends to be that those studies are done in, in divided societies. No, that was great. Thank you so much, Selma. Um, 
it seems like we are almost out of time and that exhausts some of our questions, but thank you so much for presenting your research today. And for everybody out there, thank you for joining us, um, for being here and have a wonderful Thanksgiving and winter holiday. We hope everybody stays safe and we'll see you soon. Great, thank thanks you so everyone. Much. Take care. Bye.